So as we think about holiness and speech, there's no better place to go than the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are great for speech because they're not commands or promises. They don't say, in all situations, do this or don't do this. They are navigation tools for holiness. We ponder them in light of our real-life experiences to help us make holy decisions in complicated matters. Now, Often, reading Proverbs, you'll, you'll see individual Proverbs that are grouped together to fill out something of a theme. A Proverbs is kind of like a picture on a wall. If you come into a house and you see a photo of a person on a wall, you might guess that in that house, people matter. But if there's a grouping of portraits on the wall and you start to see the relationships, then you'll, oh, oh, this, what matters in this, this, this home is a family. That's the way Proverbs kind of function when they're grouped together. Let's take a look at a nice little grouping of Proverbs, uh, portraits in a sense, that come together to, to, to give us a theme. So this is Proverbs 15, 1 through 4. A soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness of speech in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15, 1 through 4 is a grouping of sayings on the use of speech centered around the grand theme of the holiness of God. Verse 3 there. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. In Proverbs 15, 1 through 4, we're motivated toward godly speech, anchored by the truth that nothing we say escapes God's knowledge. Jesus said that we would be held accountable for every careless word that we say. Which is sobering because we use a lot of careless words, don't we? We use careless words in our homes. We use them in social media. We use them in our texting. We need the sober warnings of Proverbs to help us see the problems of bad speech. In a world filled with foolish speech, this group of Proverbs hits with force. It warms of stirred up anger and poured out folly and broken spirits. Pre speech matters, brothers and sisters. But as I was pondering this little group of Proverbs, I began to see something I hadn't noticed at first. This passage is only half about bad speech. I saw this as I considered the full message of Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord take in not just the evil, but also the good. I took that idea and looked again at the other Proverbs. And, yeah, and Proverbs, as a book, invites you to do that. It invites you to turn them over again and around again to see from different sides and gather wisdom from them. See, Proverbs 15, 1 through 4 is equally about good speech. I might even argue that the flow of each verse emphasizes the good speech slightly more than the warning against wrong speech. I began to see the prominent idea here was not to fear bad speech, but to value good speech. The good speech is the focus. The bad speech is a qualifier because in each case you see the word but, after the good speech, that means the emphasis is on the first. And the implication, if you don't pursue the emphasis, is on the second. The bad speech is a qualifier. In each case, the word but cues us into the fact that we want to focus on the primary, which is the good speech. So what is the good speech? Note that Proverbs 1, 2, and 4 address how we we respond to people, verse 1, how we give our opinions, verse 2, and how we conduct ourselves in conversations, verse 4, which kind of sums up pretty much everything we'll ever say, doesn't it? We're either responding to what people are telling us, we are giving our opinions about something, or we're in a conversation, in dialogue, 
talking back and forth. So let's unpack these briefly. 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath. This proverb addresses how we respond to the words of others. Some, someone comes at us with argumentative words. They try to goad us into conflict. So how do we respond? Now, soft talk is not weak speech. The, the word there is a very rich, diverse word, but a good way maybe to understand it is absorbent speech. A response that takes the negative energy out of what comes at us. If you, if you watch the first Captain America movie, so the original of the Avenger movies, um, Howard Stark first shows Steve Rogers the shield prototype made out of vibranium. The shield is light, but they're claiming that its strength is, is in how it absorbs and neutralizes kinetic energy that hits it. Peggy Carter picks up a gun, point blank, fires two bullets at the shield. The bullets hit the shield and drop. The shield absorbs their destructive energy on impact and renders it pointless. That's what this proverb is talking about when we say a soft answer. That I receive what you say in the tone and anger that you may say it, but my response blunts and actually removes the energy from what you said. Proverbs 15, 2. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge. Now, when you think, when you find somebody that has a different view on something than you, which we have tended to find happening over the last year, what do you typically think? Well, obviously, if they knew what I know, they would agree with me. So what does that require of us? Well, mountains of information toward them. I need to persuade them to my side. Here, read these blogs, listen to this podcast, ingest these statistics. But how many of you are really persuaded that way? None of you are. There's not a person in this room who was overwhelmed with somebody else's information that came out on the other side and said, I believe. Most likely, you saw what they were asking you to go through, and you said, no way. I don't have time to deal with this. You see, when we think that we can convince something, somebody with, with our information, we make a dangerous assumption. We assume we're right. That's not the way knowledge works. In the Bible, knowledge is a moral category, a theological category. Knowledge is only true as it aligns with the character of God. Knowledge itself pops up, Paul said. Love builds up. Good speech doesn't just give information or make arguments. It doesn't try to persuade through superior information or force of opinion. It commends knowledge. It offers information in a way that gives the other person a reason to consider it. It's not about the information, folks. It's about the delivery. And verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. This proverb contrasts healing words. Gentle words are healing words with damaging words. Wise speech prioritizes relationships over persuasion. God is looking to bless wise speech. Foolish, contentious speech ends our opportunity to make a difference for God with others. It chooses a side. It takes us out of the play. It says, I'm going to do what I think I need to do for myself, regardless of what God's agenda might be. Wise, gracious, good, holy speech invites God's blessing and participates in God's Miracle work in people's lives. We'll never win souls with argument. Jim will tell you that. Bridge is built on the assumption that you cannot argue somebody into the kingdom of God. When was the last time you won an argument about something that matters? How did it feel? 
Did you feel victorious? Maybe momentarily, but probably not for long. You probably also feel like you lost something. Maybe a friendship. Maybe some equity in your relationship with somebody. When was the last time you lost an argument? Were you grateful that the other person convinced you of something? No, probably you kind of said, that's the last time we'll ever get in a conversation about something that matters. It takes a lot of words to win an argument. Some of those words are probably going to be harsh. Some of the, it takes a lot of words to win an argument. Some of those words will be foolish. It takes a lot of words to win an argument. Some of them may break the spirit. So my focus today then is not on bad speech that we see all around us, but on the good speech that we don't see as much as we should. I want to inspire you toward good speech. Holiness in speech is the desire that my words cooperate with God's purpose. Holiness in speech is the desire that my words cooperate with God, God's purpose. And we're going to do that through a story. As I was pondering this text, I happened to be reading the letters of John Newton in my devotions. And I came across a series of eight letters he wrote over six months to a fellow minister named Thomas Scott. These letters masterfully depict the holy speech goals of Proverbs 15, 1 through 4. So rather than just quoting them at length from an, from an interaction you probably didn't know about till right now, I'm, I'm going to tell you their story and show the effects of them. Now most of us know John Newton, slave ship captain turned gospel pastor, one of the great leaders of the, of the abolition movement in the 1700s, writer of Amazing Grace, you really ought to read his story if you haven't. But you may not know Thomas Scott. So let me tell you about Thomas Scott. Thomas Scott was born in a small rural town above Nottingham, England in 1747. He was the tenth of 13 kids to a brass worker. In his youth, Thomas was able to get some rudimentary formal education before his father apprenticed him to an apothecary when he was 15. That was a disaster. He lasted about two months, and he was sent back home. His dad was ticked off at him, so he put him into the worst part of the business, which was outside almost all the time, in a smelting environment, ruined his health the rest of his life, beat him. He was finally able to get free from his father's control in his early 20s. He did have a little bit of formal education during that time, and this little bit of school gave Thomas Scott a thirst for learning. He had an aptitude for learning. As a young man with little formal education, though, and no social standing, the only opportunity to get out of the brass works and into something better for life and to pursue his intellectual interests became applying for the priesthood in the Church of England. That was his calling. I need to get out of what I'm doing and get into something that's more comfortable. In fact, this is how he, he describes his calling. My views entering into the ministry, as far as I can ascertain them, were these. Number one, a desire for a less laborious and more comfortable way of procuring a livelihood than otherwise I had prospect of. Number two, the expectation of more leisure to employ in reading, of which I was inordinately fond. And number three, a proud conceit of my abilities and a vainglorious imagination that I should sometime distinguish and advance myself in the literary world. That's why he went into the ministry. He was ordained at the age of 25 and assigned a circuit of parishes in Buckinghamshire, um, England. Now, Scott showed a significant aptitude for theology and for biblical languages, and he quickly developed a reputation uh, as an up-and-comer in the Church of England. But what Thomas Scott lacked as a minister was any kind of relationship with God and any understanding of the gospel. He was in it for prestige. He also developed a reputation as an opponent 
of what was called Methodism, which back then, we, we know now, back then was a gospel-centered, new birth, fruit-producing relationship with Jesus Christ. What we believe and teach here, what you understand as being a Christian is what he opposed. He was a proud, self-righteous, contentious man. In his own words, he said this, I was in my own opinion, in point of understanding and discernment, exalted to a superiority above the general run of mankind, and amused myself with looking down with contempt upon such as were weak enough to believe the orthodox doctrines, what you believe. Few persons have ever been more self-sufficient and positive in their opinions than I was. Fond to excess of entering into argument, I never failed on these occasions to betray this peculiarity of my character. I seldom acknowledged or suspected myself mistaken, and scarcely ever dropped an argument, till either my reasonings or obstinacy had silenced my opponent. A certain person said once of me that I was like a stone rolling down a hill, which could neither be stopped nor turned. Being in Buckinghamshire, put in the na- in neighborhood of a town called Olney, whose parish was pastored by the already famous gospel preacher John Newton. Scott was 28, Newton was 50. And Scott describes their first meeting this way. I concluded that my scheme of doctrine was the exact standard of truth And throughout this, you can substitute doctrinal issues with masks or politics or race or the draft, whatever you want. (laughs) That by my superior abilities, I was capable of confuting and convincing all who were otherwise minded. In this view of the matter, I felt an eager desire of entering into a religious controversy, especially with the Calvinists. I was at this time at at my correspondence with Mr. Newton commenced. At the visitation, in other words, at a meeting of ministers in that area, May 1775, we exchanged a few words in an argumentative way in the room among the clergy, which I believe drew many eyes upon us. At that time, he prudently declined the discourse but a day or two after sent me a short note and a little book for my perusal. It was the very thing that I wanted. And I gladly embraced the opportunity, which, according to my wishes, seemed now to offer. This I did, God knoweth, with no inconsiderable expectation that my arguments would prove irresistibly convincing and I should have the honor of rescuing a well-meaning person from his enthusiastical delusions. I looked upon his religious sentiments as rank fanaticism and entertained a very contemptuous opinion of his abilities, natural and acquired. Concealing, therefore, the true motives of my conduct are in the offer of friendship and a professed desire to know the truth, I wrote him a long letter purposing to draw him from him such an avowal and explanation of his sentiments as would introduce a controversial discussion of our religious difference. In other words, he baited a hook. You ever had that happen to you? Somebody send you something, and you realize they're trying to get you into an argument? Now, we have eight letters from John Newton responding to Thomas Scott over about six months, and Scott is relentlessly trying to stir up controversy. Scott's letters have never been published, and he was grateful for that. So we only have an idea of the issues from Newton's response and from some comments made from Scott after the fact. It's very clear that Newton is dealing with a guy who is trying to goad him into debate, not unlike what we see every day on social media. But Newton's response is beautifully displaying the application of Proverbs 15, 1 through 4. So I'm going to take a few minutes and just walk us through Newton in his response. There's a lot of quotes in here. I encourage you to read them. More, I encourage you to read those eight letters. There's actually a, um, a footnote here 
footnote uh, number six, which is, gives you access to a PDF of those letters in his book, The Card of Fania, which is where they're located. They're wonderful letters. And if you're thinking, you're going to go through this, and you, as I'm talking, you may think, well, did, did he ever speak truth to this guy? I'll tell you what, man. If you ever want to read about a defense of justification by faith alone, read these letters. You ever want to see a defense of the Trinity? Read these letters. You want to ever see a defense of election? Read these letters. It's all there. So these are not mamby-pamby, hey, hope you're doing well letters. They are inspiring gospel truth. So read them. But I'm not going to focus uh, so much on what he wrote, since you'll have a chance to read those later. You can read some of Newton's quotes. I'm going to give you more Thomas Scott's reactions to Newton, for the most part. So truth number one, uh, from, from uh, Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath. How did Newton apply this? John Newton absorbed Thomas Scott's pointed attempts to goad him into an argument. See, Scott was framing questions to trap Newton. Now, you can read these letters because it's very clear from, from, from Scott that he had no intention of befriending Newton. Uh, he was being duplicitous. But Newton throughout is, is just tr trying to relate to him as a friend. And you can wonder from L Newton's letter, is he really on to Thomas Scott's game? Does he get it? Is he just totally naive? Then you have to go back and say, who was this guy before he became a Christian? He was the captain of a slave ship. He dealt for years with the most dastardly people in the world. He had seen terrible things. And as he was a slave ship, if you read his story, you'll see that he prided himself on doing the very same thing that Thomas Scott was doing to him. He loved wrecking the faith of other people. He enjoyed getting into debate, not just to win a debate, because Newton was not, not about winning debate as an unbeliever. He was about destroying people's faith. Newton saw it from the get-go. You just realize in his responses, he says, I ain't taking that bait. I know your game. And this frustrated Scott to no end. He writes, Scott writes, I made use of every endeavor to draw him into controversy and fill my letters with definitions, inquiries, arguments, objections, and consequences. You ever gotten those kind of letters? Requiring specific answers, and so what he's basically saying here, I got, five I got ten questions, and I need you to give me specific answers to every single one. If you've ever gotten that kind of inquiry, you know it's just baiting you into saying something that somebody can jump on. He, on the other hand, shunned everything controversial as much as possible and filled his letters with the most useful and the least offensive instructions, except that now and then, he dropped hints concerning the necessity and the true nature and efficacy of faith and the manner in which it was to be sought and obtained and concerning some other matters suited as he judged to help me forward in my inquiry. So what does he do? He absorbs, he redirects, and he says, you know what? Here's some things you might want to consider. No need to get back to me on them. But consider these things. That was not what Thomas Scott was looking for. 15.2. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge. Newton pointed away from his own perspective and toward the Lord and his truth. Newton didn't polarize the conversation. He didn't say, well, this is what I think, and this is what you think, and this is where we're different, and this is the problem. He affirmed Scott's perspective wherever possible. He would comb through his letters looking for something to affirm. The letters of Newton are full of doctrinal truth, but they're absent of doctrinal debate. 
New, John Newton never mentioned anything in his letters, and this is fascinating, that Thomas Scott did not already know and had prepared an argument for. Scott knew everything he was going to say. So it wasn't a matter of Newton finding something, you know, it's kind of a little truth bomb to drop in. He knew everything. Scott was already way ahead of him on that. He just said, okay, well, let me package this in ways that don't polarize our conversation. Let me share. See, Newton wasn't counting on his arguments. He was counting on the Lord. He kept the triune God and not his own opinions at the center of his letters. There's a great quote from letter, letter 8 where he sort of begins to sum up what he's been trying to do and you see his heart and his approach there. Truth from 15.4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. Newton kept the priority of the relationship over the content of the conversation. Doesn't mean the content didn't matter. He just always had the relationship in view. Throughout his letters, he's constantly affirming and uh, inquiring and talking about the relationship that he had. A relationship that Thomas Scott didn't really care to have with him. Newton began all his letters to Scott with, my dear friend. Even though they had only met once. And even that conversation had become contentious. What's fascinating is if you read through Newton's letters, in almost all of his letters, he addresses even the people he's closest to as my dear sir or my dear madam. It's with Thomas Scott, his adversary, that he says, my dear friend. He clearly wanted to cultivate a relationship with the man in spite of their differences. And you, again, there's a longer quote there that I won't read um, that just gives you a flavor. It's kind of pulled from several of the letters. Just Newton's tone, his flavor, his relational desires, his commitments. So I'm giving you just snapshots of what Newton did. But this is the fascinating thing. What is the result? Six months of letters. What happened after Newton is carefully cultivating a relational approach through godly speech? Thomas Scott ghosted him. He shut it down. He just stopped interacting. Scott says this. I entered indeed into a correspondence with Mr. Newton. My intention, however, was not to learn from him, but to dispute with him. And when he waived controversy, I dropped the correspondence and utterly neglected his letters. From that time, I avoided his company. To speak plainly, I did not care for his company. I did not mean to make any use of him as an instructor, and I was unwilling the world should think us anyway connected. But Thomas Scott could not ghost God. All the while, God was working through Newton's good speech, even as Scott was rejecting Newton's choice words. Over the next two years, God went after Thomas Scott's theology and ultimately his heart on the very line that Newton had been pursuing. The first thing he does, and it's fascinating when he talks about it, he was provoked by Newton's example. He said, well, one thing you have to give him is he, he clearly is a, is a more, he's, he's a more holy man than me. He, Scott, Tom Scott could care nothing about holiness at all. He, he, was, he, was, he, he actually had a lot of sin issues he was dealing with. So he said, you know, I've got to clean up my act. If I'm going if, if, if if, if to prove that I'm as good as Newton, I've got to clean up my act. And so he commenced a self-renovation project, which lasted a couple of months, and then he just gave it all up because he couldn't do it. Um, so then he began to sort of say, okay, well, Newton clearly is having an impact with people. I'm looking at my people. They're kind of generally the same week in and week out. The, the group, the, my congregation isn't growing. It isn't, nothing's happening. Um, and in the process of assessing what his impact was, he realized that he was great with words, but nothing happened when he spoke. So he started 
getting the printed sermons of other Methodist preachers who seemed to be having an impact, and he started mixing his own words in and then preaching those sermons as if they were his own. And that led him to believe, I really don't know the Bible. Because all I've ever used the Bible for is to build my arguments up. I cherry-pick Bible verses to build my arguments. And so he began to read the Bible for the first time to actually try to learn from it. His heart began to soften. He started to read books that challenged his views for the first time ever. He didn't agree with anything he was reading, but it began to seep into his preaching unknown to himself. He started having people come to him from his congregation under the conviction of the Spirit pleading with him to show them the way of salvation, and that was kind of awkward. <laughs> Scott says, I knew not well what to say to them, my views being very cl greatly clouded and my sentiments concerning justification very much perplexed. <laughs> but being willing to give them the best counsel I could, I exhorted them in a general way to believe Jesus. Well, just believe in Jesus. Though I was incapable of instructing them either concerning the true nature of faith or in what matter they were to seek it. This singular circumstances of being an instrument in bringing others earnestly and sex successfully to inquire after salvation while I so little understood the true gospel of Jesus Christ very much increased my, my perplexity. One by one, God was dismantling his arguments through the revelation of Jesus in the gospel and the convicting words, works of the Holy Spirit. God was using John Newton's own words against Thomas Scott's will. Scott began to realize he was headed toward the very place he had tried to argue Newton out of. In Scott's words, he says, but now I began to be apprehensive that the tables were about to be turned on me. <laughs> if I professed and taught these doctrines, I must no longer, among, among his constituents, be considered as a man of sober understanding, but as one of those persons whose head, being naturally weak, had been turned by religious studies and who having fallen under the power of enthusiasm, had become no better than fools or madmen. Basically, what he had been accusing them of, he was considering, should I be one of those as well? Slowly, Scott began to realize that, he, that where he thought he'd been searching out God, what was really happening is God was searching him out. And around December 1777, almost exactly two years after his last letter with Newton, Reverend Thomas Scott was born again. From that point on, his, his call was radically changed. As he expressed it shortly after his conversion, my desire henceforth, God knoweth, is to live for his glory and by my whole contact and conversation to adorn the doctrine of God my Savior and to show forth his praises who hath called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. To be in some way or other useful to his believing people and to invite poor sinners who are walking in a vain shadow and disquieting themselves in vain to taste and see how gracious the Lord is and how blessed are they who put their trust in Him. Now, these words are taken from a book, a short memoir he published two years later called The, Vo the Force of Truth. And that details his conversation, his conversion following his conversations with Newton. Scott looks back on those letters and recalls the ultimate effects they had on him. This is the effect of godly speech on a man. His letters will, I hope, shortly be made public, which they were, being such as promise greater usefulness to others than through my proud, contentious spirit I experienced from them. Mine deserve only to be forgotten, except as they are useful to me to remind me what I was and to mortify my pride as they illustrate my friend's patience and candor 
in so long bearing with my ignorance and arrogance, and notwithstanding my unteachable quarrelsome temper, continuing his benevolent labors for my good. This is godly speech, brothers and sisters. And especially as they remind me of the goodness of God, who though he abominates and resists the proud, yet he knows how to bring down the star. He knows how to bring down the stout stout heart, not us. It ain't our job to kill pride. Only, not only by the iron rod of his wrath, but by the golden scepter of his grace. By that time, the two had become friends, and Newton became a spiritual father to Thomas Scott. Such was the profound effect of this relationship that when Newton left Olney to take a key pastor in London in 1881, Scott was his chosen successor to take over his church. That's the power of good speech. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? How holy speech of one man helped rewrite the story of another. But it doesn't end there. The most notable experience Thomas Scott had in Olney was the opportunity to take what he'd received from Newton and pass it on to another young man. At a friend's house in Olney, Thomas Scott met a 21-year-old cobbler's apprentice who was casting around to figure out what he believed. Scott began to meet with the man and invite him to his church for worship. Within a a year, that young man had come to Christ. That young man soon began to develop a burden for lost souls beyond England a burden that led him eventually to become the man we now know as the father of modern missions. William Carey traced his conversation back to the witnesses of several men, but none more than Thomas Scott, of whom he wrote, If there be anything of the work of God in my soul, I owe much of it to his preaching when I first set out in the ways of the Lord. God continued to work in Thomas Scott's heart as well. He could have settled comfortably into the care of a quiet country parish, but once again, he, the ambition got the best of him. However, this time it was an ambition not to religious prominence, but an ambition to spend and be spent for the cause of Christ. After only four years at Olney, Scott was contacted about an opening for a chaplaincy at the Lock Hospital in London. The Lock Hospital had been established by Christians a few years before with one purpose. To minister the physical needs and illnesses of women caught in sex trafficking and prostitution. This became Newton's mission, uh, Thomas Scott's mission. Over the next decade plus, he served as hospital chaplain And during that time, he established an asylum, a home for women trying to escape prostitution and sex trafficking. And then he he established a chapel where he could preach to them in their spiritual needs. Over time, Scott's preaching, consistently stressing both the glories of the gospel and the call to mission and good works, began to draw evangelicals from all over the city, even among the upper echelon of society. At the Lock Chapel, prostitutes sat side by side with parliamentarians under the preaching of God's word. One such parliamentarian was a young politician named William Wilberforce. Wilberforce had been wrestling with a call to the ministry, but he was challenged in, 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 a, in a very f- famous way by his friend John Newton to stay in politics for the mission of Christ. But Newton knew something. He knew that if, if Wilberforce came to his church, was, which was a church full of the movers and shakers in London, he would just get caught up in that world. And so he said, what do I need to do? How can I help this guy? Let me send him to Thomas Scott and the Lock Chapel. So Wilberforce goes to the Lock Chapel, and that's where he is, that's where he is, 
he, he, he establishes his membership. That's where he's taught how to live out the Christian life. Sitting among the poor, sitting among the prostitutes, listening to the preaching of Thomas Scott. Wilberforce would take that and go on to lead the fight against slavery, but also against the moral evils that he saw every day around him in his church. He sat with the destitute, listening to the preaching of Reverend Scott. Decades later, upon upon hearing the death of Thomas Scott, Wilberforce wrote of his debt to the minister who'd become a lifelong friend. Wilberforce praised Scott's And I want you to listen to this in light of what we talked about with Newton. Scott's extensive acquaintance with the scripture, his accurate knowledge of the human heart, and his vehement, powerful appeals to the conscience, with which all his sermons abounded to a greater degree than those of any other minister I ever attended. Were I required to specify the particular Christian principles which shone most conspicuously in his character, I should mention his simplicity of intention, in other words, his absolute sincerity. This is the man who who would stake a friendship to win an argument. Wilberforce says, his sincerity, his disinterested, his lack of worldly ambition, Scott, who saw winning an argument with Newton as a way to establish himself as a player, no longer had worldly ambition. And his generous contempt of this world's wealth in comparison with those heavenly treasures on which his heart was supremely set. It's, this, it's these very principles, brothers and sisters, through John's Newton letters to Thomas Scott, 50 years earlier, still reverberated in his life. So my closing point is this, and it's very simple. You can win an argument, and it will give you maybe 15 minutes of satisfaction. You can commit yourself to holy speech, And it can affect people for generations to come. Let's do that. Thanks.